Alright, I'm gonna try something different today. Outside the window is the sea of stars, the infinite. If you walk outside today and look up towards heaven, you might see it, or maybe you won't because the sky is so blue. But beyond that blue sky, I assure you, there is an infinite universe, a distance beyond human comprehension, and that distance is forever. If there's one thing that Leiji Matsumoto taught me, it's that the infinite distance is somewhat more perceivable if you're traveling and when you're traveling. If you're on a boat, if you're on an airplane, hell, even a train, you can sense it. You can sense the curvature of the earth and you can sense that you're just a little bit more clearly on this planet. And people are small and life is brief and maybe the earth is dying and maybe we're all too small to see it. I feel like I learned a lot from Matsumoto. I can't say I wouldn't be working on my own anime right now if he hadn't inspired me by showing the strength and the limitations of 2D classic 70s anime. Hell, the fact that Matsumoto's works from the 70s have either aged like fine wine or been refurbished if they haven't, that alone shows you like the man's impact. Leiji Matsumoto created the Matsumotoverse, probably one of the first and only self-contained cinematic universes in manga, loosely inspired by the interconnected way that the Toho Godzilla movies were connected making them the first cinematic universe. But hey, Matsumoto had the first one in manga, so that's gotta count for something. See, Matsumoto's universe like connected pretty much all his manga and all his anime, with the sole exception of Space Battleship Yamato, which was in its own category, not quite owned by him, and so therefore legally distinct from all his other works. But aside from Yamato, like everything else is completely connected in a weird, haphazardly way. This is going to be a little bit different than the usual videos I do, and for Matsumoto's case, I can't really say much about him. I don't think I know him personally. I don't think I ever knew him personally, but I know his works and I know his characters. And so that's why I'm here today on the Galaxy Railways, thinking about his characters. Sisamu Kodai is the prototypical Matsumoto protagonist who evolves to have a lot in common with Captain Harlock. He's the main character of Space Battleship Yamato, but maybe I'll get into him later. There's a lot of cliches about the old meeting of strangers on a train. Nowadays, that kind of thing seems a bit antiquated, but it's still a fun way to meet people if you never actually make it work. And Matsumoto's works were full of that. Having watched as many of them as I could find, it's bizarre how relatable it all is in the end. I guess to break it all down, the first person you should probably meet if you're taking a journey through the Matsumoto vs. Tetsuro. Specifically the television Tetsuro, the goofy little kid. This is the Tetsuro from the Galaxy Express 3-9 TV show. Now, there's another Tetsuro in like the movies and the remakes and the sequels, and that Tetsuro honestly doesn't feel the same. That Tetsuro is more of like a legendary character, and the fact he looks remarkably different makes it feel like it's a different character to me. For me, Tetsuro is the TV version, the goofy, ugly kid. This kid is Leiji Matsumoto as a child, and he's a lonely child who's lost everything. He's embraced the randomness of whatever's going to come along. Galaxy Express 3.9 is a truly pure experience. It's the loneliness of traveling alone as a child, the awkwardness and the chaos of public transportation, and the bizarre fact that every planet the 3.9 stops at is Ultimately, in the end, just some weird allegory for a philosophical idea, a social stigma. Just some problem that is bigger than a human being. Tetsuro's major arc is that of going from being a child who wants to be someone powerful, no matter how negative that is, and instead learning that that is not the right thing. He learns to be an individual. And his strange mislead of where his goals are taking him lead him to understand that being a rich immortal robot won't really work out for him because he encounters more and more people who pursued this path and ended at this goal only to end there insane broken and miserable so the final lesson of three nines just be yourself because most other people are just completely wrong especially when it comes to you right am i ready to talk about maytel yet no i'm not yet so after Tetsuro, we should probably talk about Tochiro Oyama. Tochiro is prominently seen in a lot of Captain Harlock shows, but he appears in other places, and I feel like because of the abundant weirdness and incongruity of the Matsumotoverse, sometimes when he appears, he changes forms and 
takes on bizarre different forms and other reincarnations but but to me totoro is just matsumoto as an awkward adult hence why he looks exactly like tetsuro but aged up and with a pair of glasses totoro is a lot less interesting than tetsuro though while he's ultimately captain harlick's best friend he's ultimately also a blue collar engineer who builds the arcadia and builds anything harlock needs to solve a problem Despite the fact that Totoro is supposed to be an adult, usually, like Tetsuro, Totoro is ultimately just Matsumoto's self-insert. But since Totoro only appears in a supporting role, and he appears a lot less frequently than other characters, like sometimes he'll show up as a ghost or a hologram or some other strange thing, he's a little bit harder to pin down. Let's go back to Susumu now. So Susumu is another important character, but he's also somewhat interchangeable with a lot of the other heroes of the Matsumotoverse. Like, Manabu from Galaxy Railways is essentially the same character. But once again, these characters also have similar arcs to Tetsuro. The only difference is they're seen from the eyes of a young adult instead of that of a child. You could also once again consider that Susumu was another alternate outcome for Tetsuro. Tetsuro aged up into a handsome young man. In the end, a lot of Matsumoto's heroes were a lot alike. They all had dead family issues that they were trying to get past. They all had lovers. They all had adventures. They seemed to be on the same identity-seeking quests and adventure that Tetsuro completed as a child. A lot of them are ultimately just self-insert shell protagonists for the audience to relate to, although usually viewed through Leiji Matsumoto's general worldview and philosophy. I think that now that Matsumoto has passed, in the end he's left behind three great legacies, although Galaxy Express is probably my favorite work of his, Yamato is going to be remembered as his masterpiece, and even if Yamato is his masterpiece, I think Harlock and Meito will ultimately live on as his archetypal ultimate man and ultimate woman respectively. Someday when I'm really feeling up to it, I'll probably get into Space Battleship Yamato, but Yamato is its own beautiful kind of sad, and I don't really need to get into that extra sadness on this trip. I'm already sad enough. But for now, I just recommend that if you want to experience the best version of Yamato, Matsumoto's most famous work, check out the 2199 remix. Alright, I guess I'll address Harlock and Maitel now. Harlock and Maitel are kind of intertwined in pop culture, even if they're characters who are pretty significantly different and who never really hung out. I swear to god they had to meet at least once though, right? Captain Harlock is a bizarre character, ruled by his convictions, is willing to fight anyone for freedom. Successor of the 1000 year dynasty of pirate knight Captain Harlocks, and who somehow all had kids who all were named Captain Harlock and all looked exactly alike, and a lot of them became pirates too. At the beginning of Arcadia of My Youth, Harlock reflects on an ancestor of his from the early 1900s who was haunted by the specter of a mountain goddess or some kind of witch that lived in the mountain. I don't know what this is, but I think it's a reflection on Matsumoto's own state of mind and his bizarre, intense obsession with the 1950s German starlet Marion Hold. While Matsumoto was married to a fellow mangaka, Miyoko Maki, who was one of his assistants tasked primarily with drawing female characters and making them look pretty, Matsumoto had this strange obsession with this tall, thin, blonde German woman who he never knew. I'm not sure where this came from, but it's in all of his works, and it's definitely something that stunk deep into his subconscious. These tall, dark, blonde women with these gorgeous flowing robes. Nevertheless, Maytel is his phantom prevalent in all of his works. And sometimes when I'm talking about Maytel, like, I think I have a bit of a time in my own head this marrying the literal black hat, probably a robot Maytel from Galaxy 39, with the numerous other women in like literally everything Matsumoto would make that look exactly like Maytel, but they're not Maytel. Like, sometimes they'll clearly explain that they're not Maytel, but other times it's just, hey, look at her, she looks exactly like Maytel. And it became such a joke in pop culture that some people just consider them all Maytel. I don't know, I know they're not all Maytel, but so many people consider them all to be Maytel that, <sighs> I don't know, it's a bit of a corruption of the Tezuka star system. Matsumoto's works use something a little bit similar, but a little bit more messy and gooey, so you end up with a hundred different Captain Harlocks who are not all Captain Harlocks, a hundred different Totoros, and a hundred beautiful blonde women with the same face. 
Since almost all Matsumoto's women are Meito, I guess I have to consider Queen Emeraldus to probably be the only standalone other character from Meito in the Leiji verse, at least as far as being a woman. Although if I do want to be really cynical about it, she's just a Meito with red hair, but at least she's gritty and at least she's willing to kick some ass when I got to. Alright, let's end it with Harlock. Harlock was Matsumoto's ultimate based hero. Despite the simplicity of Harlock's story, in the long run it feels like Harlock was the one that Matsumoto was always trying to get just right, and at the same time he could never get him just right. Because while Yamato was universally loved upon release, and Yamato was perfect then and perfect now, and so was Galaxy Express 3.9 for that matter, Harlock on the other hand has had probably the most reboots and retellings and sequels, and all just for the sake of getting Captain Harlock's story absolutely perfect. And right now I feel like I've watched all the Harlocks, except maybe the SSX TV show, but apparently before he died, Matsumoto did one last reboot of Harlock as a manga to try and set the record straight one last time. Maybe I should look that manga up, or at least I should reconsider if all the Harlock manga actually did make sense if you put it in the right order. I don't know, there were lots of ups and downs and strange twists and turns because there were so many different Harlock anime produced by so many different animation teams throughout like four different decades, but in the end, the one thing that stayed the same about Captain Harlock was his core philosophy that if the government of the place where you're living doesn't let you live freely, then fuck that government. Run away, go on the run, run your entire life if you have to. That's the only way you can really be free. There's this clip in Arcadia of my youth where uh, they spotlight this German ancestor of Captain Harlock's who was like a rich Duke of Germany forced to fight for the Nazis in World War II. And eventually he just decides, fuck it, the Nazis are evil, so he flies to Switzerland and he's immediately shot to death by the Swiss. It's still though better to die a free man in Switzerland than to live helping Nazis. I think this scene says a lot about who Captain Harlock is. In the end, Harlock stands as a pure and base space pirate captain who only seeks to survive and fight injustice. Now that Matsumoto is gone, I really think his characters will keep on living for quite some time. Hell, they still have to close up the other Yamato remakes. I, I'm still not even caught up with them, I've only seen the first uh, season. I think someone will probably try to adapt Captain Harlock one more time, and for what it's worth, the character might still endure for what he represents. Let me tell you guys one more story that happened on the 3-9. There was another episode, this time it was episode 37. This one's called Meikun's Mansion of Life. And this episode is one of the only episodes I know that was literally based on something from Matsumoto's personal life. And this episode is him trying to express his feelings, and it's really weird. So Matsumoto has a cat named Mikun, and I'm guessing he actually has several cats named Mikun because somehow he has this cat in the 1970s, and then a few years later he has another identical cat in like a different decade. But, so, the crux of this episode is that in the 1970s, the original Mikun number one died, and... For all extents and purposes, this episode serves as her funeral. In this episode, the 3-9 Maytail and Tetsuro stop at a place called Mikun's Mansion of Life, and it's basically this non-episode where they just stop at this place, look at it, explain what it is, and leave. So as they're getting to the Mansion of Life, Mikun is on the train with them and she's bringing this kid into this planet, so they get off and they follow her around. So, what Mikun's Mansion of Life is, it's this planet entirely filled with way too many animals. It's just chaotic and dangerous and kind of crazy, but despite that, all the animals are peaceful and happy, and there's this like weird calming vibe about it. So, as it turns out, like the lady whose name Mikun is Matsumoto's cat, because Matsumoto's cat has died and become this like ghost woman in her afterlife, and now she's acting as like this Shinigami slash Grim Reaper for all the forgotten and abandoned animals in the universe. And it presents you with this bizarre reality that all these animals are peace because they're all dead and this is like a ghost planet, or more to the point, it's animal heaven. Anyway, as Tetsuro and the 3-9 leave, the planet instantly disappears, and you're left wondering if any of it was actually real. 
And the narrator pretty much grimly states that there is no heaven, but if you remember someone, their spirit will live on in your heart, then that's about the best you can do. Anyway, that musical he did with Daft Punk was pretty cool, right? Sail the sea of stars, Captain. All right, the video's over, but um, before I leave, there's one last thing I wanted to address. When I was living in Japan in 2012, I saw a show on TV, and I don't know what it was. It might have been a made-for-TV movie, or it might have been um, just a movie airing on TV, but it seemed to be a biopic of Liji Matsumoto, and the only thing I really remember about it is it had this kid cosplaying as Tetsuro in, like, a Japanese restaurant... And I guess they were, like, watching Galaxy Express 3-9 on a TV. And I think this was a biopic, but for all I know, it was just, like, a bad, like, parody of, like, the show. I don't know. I thought that was cool. And I kind of wish it was a biopic, because if it was a biopic, I would watch it right now. Let me know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm probably, like, honestly, probably, like, no one in the West has ever seen whatever the hell this was, so I'm doubting we'll be able to find it, but... It was really cool, whatever it was. Alright, later guys. Another pioneer has passed.